Awesome. Perfect. Well, welcome, everybody. So uh, this is the first part of a two-part series on the digestive tract. Uh, the first part, we're going to concentrate more on the upper part, mouth, uh, esophagus, stomach, gallbladder, uh, pancreas, and then we'll dive into the small intestine, large intestine, and all that plays a role. Uh, and then, of course, the, what most people would now consider another uh, um, system is the microbiome, the actual good and bad bacteria that you have in your system. So, welcome. Come on in, have a seat. All right. So, 38 million Americans suffer from some kind of digestive disorder that they know of. Okay. Um, cost us about $123 billion a year, so it's really the number one costing thing in, um, in our healthcare system. When you compare it to cancer at $17 billion, and uh, circulatory problems, so heart disease, stuff like that, $58 billion. So uh, you see where this really starts to play a big role in a lot of people's lives. You know, most people are going to complain of gas, bloating, uh, cramping, the diarrhea, constipation, or a combination of both. Um, you know, foul smelling bowel movements, things like that. Uh, uncommon complaints that people don't really realize that happens. So headaches, right? Muscle aches and pains, walks in the door all the time. Uh, eczema, acne. It's a couple of different things when people come in with acne. We're looking inside, not outside. We don't want to put something on top of something. Uh, swelling in the lower legs uh, and lower back pain because I guess where things like to radiate to, right? So come on in. Because there's so much overlap between a lot of the uh, symptoms and other things, it's really hard to start to digest down which is really causing a lot of the issues. So because of that overlap, uh, and a lot of people just believe that's the way that they are. Like, well, yeah, if I eat a meal, so, so I just stay away from it. I might not eat then, or I do this. So, so you actually you avoid the things that might um, that cause you issues. So people will eat one meal a day, and it'll consist of you know, some kind of sugary carb or something like that, because it's the only thing that the body can really break down. Um, but unbeknownst to them, they're just feeding even more. Like that. So, uh, and it needs to really be dealt with as a systems approach. When you talk about the system, it's not just, oh, you go to your, your endocrinologist for your hormones or your, uh, your, you know, you get scoped at your gastroenterologist. So we're, we're being compartmentalized by, by the actual organs and not actually by this whole system itself. So we need to really look at that whole system as how, this, how it begins at the top and what happens down at the bottom. All right, so digestion from the top down. First part, right? So when we talk about digestion, the first part where it starts, brain. Okay? Because you have that link to your gut and vice versa. So when you start thinking about food, you know, who goes to the grocery store and they're like, oh, you never want to go on an empty stomach, right? It just makes you that much more hungry. And you tend to buy stuff that you probably wouldn't buy. Come on up. Kiss my seat. Come on in, don't be shy, or stay right back. Uh, the reason this is, the reason you have this link is there's a very large nerve called your vagus nerve. Okay. So this is a cranial nerve, number 10. Okay. What happens is that this is your communication from your gut to your brain, brain to your gut. When people get low, what they call low vagal tone, so the, the signal isn't is interrupted somehow, you tend to start to slow down your digestion. So there's where your constipation can start to really rear its ugly head. Um, anxiety and depression symptoms, this is a lot of this as well too. One of the ways that we look for it is uh, you have somebody stick out their tongue and you go, ah, 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 and you watch their heart palate, because it's your gag reflex, right? So if the heart palate goes nice, it should you should be pretty good with that. A lot of times, as you're doing that, it starts to get really slow, or one side it's not off, it's not nice and uh, even. So you start to work on that to get that brain link. Uh, you see it in concussions, uh, people obviously with anxiety and depression issues. What we usually have them do is we gargle. So sing really loud is also, but most people just prefer to gargle. <laughs> Humming really loud, you know. Every once in a while, you get the person that sings. 
Um, I had a patient that says in yoga they hum really loud at the type of yoga that she does. And she's like, yep, that's perfect. Continue to do that. You improve that vagal tone uh, and just keep working on that. So there are ways to stimulate it and gargling is just the easiest way that I, hopefully everybody brushes their teeth and then uh, can gargle after they're done, right? They rinse in their mouth, put some water in, tip your head back, gargle until your eyes start to water. There you go. So you're stimulating it. Uh, it also gives you your stretch reflex in your stomach. So when you eat something and it starts to fill your stomach, that tells your brain, hey, I'm full, so I'm done, right? What we usually, what happens though, especially last weekend, right, during Thanksgiving, is we eat so fast that we buy, the brain, the brain can't get the signal to our, the stomach can't get the signal to the brain, so then we sit there and we're like, oh, I don't know, you eat so much, because we eat too fast, typically. Uh, we talked about this leads to constipation, the gargling, uh, and that anticipation. That's why. That's what makes you hungry, is this nerve. Uh, one of the other ways, just preparing your meals, because we'll just say cook at home, eat as a family. Very therapeutic for that vagus nerve. Okay? So, eat with your family. Hopefully you love them. All right. So after the brain, food enters what? The mouth, right? Chew your food. Thoroughly. Okay, this is probably the number one thing that you can do just to start getting better digestion. Chew your food more. On average, if you go home, your next meal and breakfast, just count to how many times you actually chew your food before you swallow, and you'll be, you'll be like, oh, I chew 10, 20 times. It's usually like five before you start to swallow it, wash it back, right? Especially if you're drinking with it, take a few jumps, and then you, then you drink it down. So you, you're not actually grinding it down to where it should be, so it makes it really hard for your stomach to start to break that down. It should be chewed to it's almost liquid. That's ideal. And usually about 30, you know, the 100, I don't know, you, you'd have to work your way up to 100, but at least 30 times is kind of on average what you should do, 20 to 30 times. Uh, why, why that also plays a role when you chew your food down is you give your the, the salivary glands, the parotid glands, to actually give it time to break it down. Because you can't break down any food if it, you chew, 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 and gulp, and it's down in your stomach, right? So it really hasn't even started the digestive process when you do that. Especially carbs and fat digestion. So you eat, you know, a decent fat, say you eat an avocado, squishing it around, you swallow or swallow it because it's pretty easy to swallow, right? You just set your stomach up for a hard time of digestion because it wasn't already started to break it down. Um, also, when you start getting that saliva, that's what also is antiseptic in your mouth, so it helps with that tooth decay, gum disease, things like that, because gum disease leads to heart disease. So that's another big issue. That's why dentists always want to look for that and then take your blood pressure now because if you have gum disease and they miss heart disease, it's not, it's not a good day for them. Uh, there's also a protein inside here an enzyme that uh, will bind to your B12. So B12 deficiency is pretty rampant because we'll talk about more of that because the next step in the stomach, there plays a role in there too. So it can actually be kept safe in the stomach. So when it binds to your B12, it then is able to stay safe in that stomach, otherwise it gets disintegrated and you become B12 deficient. Yay. Uh, and then one other thing, a lot of people get this. Okay. Dehydration is usually number one. Okay. Coffee drinkers, it's a diuretic. So if people are just like, oh yeah, drink, drink four cups of coffee, five cups of coffee. But um, dry mouth is a big thing. Uh, CoQ10, it's another sign, linked to your heart. All right. CoQ10 is great for your heart, it's your heart muscle um, energy source. So that's another one. People on statin drugs, it's a big one. You get a lot of dry mouth. Okay. So the big thought, chew, count, one, two, until it becomes a habit, right? You don't want to start, you don't want to start chewing to 100 right away, why? And you get the TMJ issues, right? Your jaw starts to get sore and you can't eat food for a while. So chew your food thoroughly, that's huge. Chew more, eat less, huh? Well, that's the other thing, right? So if you chew your food more and actually have, so they, they, they talk a lot about mindful eating, where you sit down, and you really think about the meal that you're about to eat and what you're thankful for, and that sets your digestion up even better. 
And those people that do that uh, typically have better health just in general, right? And just being grateful in general is always a good thing to start with. All right, your esophagus, it takes about six seconds for food to get from your mouth down into your stomach. So the esophagus uh, is, doesn't play a huge role other than um, the sphincter at the bottom, right? So you got this big long tube that goes into your stomach. Okay. At the bottom here, there's this thing called your lower This is the bad boy that keeps everything inside the stomach there. So people get that reflux. This is the this is the main issue that this flap here isn't closing tightly over where it uh, should stay down. So what happens is uh, say somebody gets a car accident. Okay. One of the most common areas: neck, cervical issues. Um, slip and fall, they got a they got a herniated disc in here, pressing on the nerve. Okay, that's where the nerve goes to. So if you got something going on there, that's one other thing. So that's why you should be adjusted, right? Get adjusted. Mm -hmm. We work on the other stuff, so that's why when we do this stuff, we actually want we want to be adjusted as well at that time. Because that nervous system is going to help control a lot of this as well too. Vagal nerve, C1 at the top, that's how you can affect that as well too. So that's another good one. Alright, so Probably the biggest lie that's been told um, as we move down. So it's because of that lower esophageal sphincter, it gets a signal from stomach acid, okay? So as we move into the stomach, the biggest lie you've been told is that stomach acid is bad for you, okay? In fact, acid is good for you, okay? In your stomach, you don't want you don't want stomach. Obviously, you don't want acid spilling out into other spots where it can burn it, right? That's why, and obviously, the biggest thing is uh, cancer of the esophagus. That's a really serious thing. But ninety percent of people that have reflux or a stomach acid issue, and that valve doesn't close, is that there's not enough acid in there to tell it to close tightly. So you overeat, that's usually what a lot of it is, you, you overeat, then you might lay down and you get that reflux going into your, um, you take an antacid, it starts to decrease your pH in your stomach or make it more neutral, and you start to produce less and less acid because now you can self-medicate, right? You can just go and get 10 milligrams worth of Prilosec from the grocery store and start to self-medicate yourself. Um, that stomach really needs to secrete that hydrochloric acid. So what it does, so HCL is what we want, and it should be at 0.8 typically with food. All right? Without food, so without food, between 1 and 3. This is the pH scale. Anybody, everybody kind of know what that is? So when the pH... Here's water, is that a seven? Acid, alkaline. I know, the same way we got soil broken up, huh? Yeah, it's the same thing, right? Yeah. So, so seven is a neutral pH, acid here. So your stomach acid is, you know, if this is zero, here's where you should be at 0.8, okay? When you eat food. So you take a you take an acid reducer and now you're at four. Okay? There's no way that you can digest your food at a four. Because at a five you're considered um, hypochlorhydria, so lack of stomach acid. And they'll start to try to do something for that. Okay? So the more neutral this is, the faster the stomach empties. So uh, it won't stay in there to be digested because it's like, oh, okay, well, we're done, so let's slide right through. What that does is you'll start to see stuff in the toilet that looks more whole than it does <coughs> under there. That's where the issue comes in because you can't digest, you can't absorb that stuff when it's in that big a chunk. And it leads to other problems down the road. It also, the, the stomach is, 
So the mouth is your first antiseptic area. Your stomach is really your first anti-infection. So if you're sitting at a stomach acid around four or five, a lot of stuff can start to grow in there and you can get bacterial infections, viruses, because you, you go out to eat somewhere and somebody doesn't wash their hands, right? Next thing you know, you get that, whatever he didn't wash his hands, becomes now you. It's always feces fingers food, right? That's where it is. Uh, so that is really your first, somebody coughs and you, you know, are next to them, right? And breathing some of that in, it's gonna get into you. That kills it. So I must rather have the pH on one or three so that I have a much better chance. So the people that you see a lot of times that are sick have one of the th big things is that their pH in their stomach is very, very neutral. So we want to definitely make, a t make that, take a look at that. Anybody here of H. pylori? Mm -hmm. Ulcers. Yeah, it, it definitely is linked to ulcers. Um, the reason it's linked to because this infection uh, is also another way to increase the pH uh, to a more neutral, so you won't digest it. Okay? So that's a big issue there. It goes underlying, about 25% of people have an H. pylori infection. It's very hard to diagnose. Uh, there's five different ways and none of them are solid. You can do a urine sample. Uh, the kind of the gold standard was the biopsy, but how your stomach is actually shaped so inside, there's like these folds. So as they take a biopsy here, it's all sitting in here. Oh, you don't have it. So we don't treat you for that H. pylori infection. Great. So you, if you can't get if you can't get somebody's stomach acid to start to get better um, on some simple things to do, we'll talk about later. Then within 30 days, if they're not seeing improvement, then I know they got an H. pylori infection because it should it, if they're off of their medications and doing the certain things that I asked them to do, yeah, that's an H. pylori infection. So even though it was not diagnosed. Okay. What do you have to do if you have that? Uh, we use a couple different products. There's a uh, something in garlic that works really well to kill things. Um, so that works really well. You don't feed the beast. Uh, a lot of times we'll have people use apple cider vinegar, but with an H. pylori infection, it only goes down to about a four. Uh, for the pH level, which is probably good because if it was down to one or three, you'd probably burn yourself. Even if you diluted it with water, it's still pretty, um, it's pretty acidic. So apple cider vinegar really should be meant for people that are um, just trying to maintain a lot of that stuff and acidify a lot of the rest of the system at a four rather than just being um, somebody who's sick all the time or has an ongoing gut infection or something like that, yep. or an ongoing pylori infection. That's right, you need to really hit that. So, uh, one of the other things too, uh, histamine is released also in the stomach um, to help produce that. So without it, this is where you get the allergies without the, without the um, uh, hydrochloric acid. So then histamine becomes, you become histamine intolerant. So that's where another big issue comes into it. Okay, right. one of the enzymes, so this is where B12 is super important. B12 and your protein. Get okay, two specific things. Pepsin. Not Pepsi, but Pepsin. Right. So this is this is separate from your hydrochloric acid. If you're at a five or above, you can't secrete it. Your body won't. Okay. So this helps you digest your protein. Why is that important? Well, proteins make up muscles, anything that's growing, neurotransmitters, hormones, so basically everything you need to grow in your body. Okay? So if somebody's low on their pH, uh, more neutral, and don't screen enough pepsin, they can't make any neurotransmitters, there's your anxiety and depression. Okay? So can't make serotonin without tryptophan, so all that turkey you ate just goes right through you because you got a pH that's sitting at, because you took your antacid right after you, <laughs> after you ate your meal, right? took down some toms or your pile or took it before. So you didn't screen any of that and you're not getting any benefit out of that, that meat that you just ate. Uh, and you also, if you get to a five, you're gonna see, you're gonna see food in the toilet. You'd be like, oh, well, what the heck was that? Why is that going? So that should be a sure sign that you're not, uh, you're not doing too well. All right, the other one, this is protein. 
something called intrinsic factor. Right, this is created to if the, only if the stomach acid gets below a four. All right, uh, this binds to your B12. So once it's held safe, this is what binds to that B12. Why is B12 important? Well, who's got an older um, mom, dad that they're that they're seeing in dementia? Yeah. Right. So a lot of times. The regular doctor won't test it. The neurologists they test B12 now because a lot of times they get they have to do um, they're doing the testing on them, so the cognitive ability testing, and so they'll they'll quick test B12 to make sure because B12 is linked to dementia. You used to only see it in alcoholics. They get neurological issues because they're so deficient in it they weren't absorbing because all they do is drink alcohol. But so yeah, definitely if you have an older individual, you want their B12 definitely checked. And then there's stomach acid. Uh, there's a really good book called Why Stomach Acid is Good for You. Just snazzy title, huh? <laughs> Dr. Wright. So I think it was like 12 bucks on Amazon. The first part of it's it'll go through all the anatomy and stuff like that, but then the second part he does talk about a lot of the dementia and stuff like that. So it's actually really interesting to read. It goes back way in history where yes, they used to try to induce add more acid in the stomach for beneficial um, health problems, and somewhere along the line we thought acid was bad and we came up with acid reducers. So um, I am a huge when I see somebody on one of those. That's the first drug I want them off because it's really hard to get somebody better if they have a say a sprain strain and they're on an acid reducer. That's never going to heal because you can't feed them enough protein because they can't digest it and absorb it um, to get that area better. And they'll stay inflamed and things like that, and they'll re-injure it. And so there's those. That's really one of the issues is that. And I also worry about their brain when they get older because they can't digest fat and absorb fat either, and so their brain they become a diabetic. And it's a gateway drug. That's why I want them off it as much as I can. It's just a pain in the butt to try to get somebody to, to go off it when they've been on it for, I think the longest has been 30 years that I've known somebody. Mm -hmm. the, original, the original time frame was only two weeks. And now they tell them, now they tell them, oh, just stay on it for a lifetime, you're good. Mm -hmm. And now they, and you can buy it at, on, over the counter, so you could be on it as long as you wanted, for as long as you wanted. Is that B12 we're talking about, or? Well, the, the acid reducers, oh, they just, yeah. I just want them to, I, it just leads to other things down the road. Yep. The B12 is supposed to be good, right? Yeah, yep. And a lot of times, when they're older individuals, they'll actually do B12 injections if they're so low, because it's, you can't supplement enough. You'd have to, they'd have to take a bottle at a time. It's just easier to get it right into the system, because to supplement, Part of this issue then too is if I give somebody a supplement to digest, their stomach, I gotta know that their stomach's gonna be able to, to break it down and then be absorbed in their small intestine. So that's why I'm always working on the top. Because one of the best signs I heard is whatever happens in the north is gonna show up in the south, right? Mm -hmm. So if you got something going on in your mouth or your stomach that you can't do something, it's definitely gonna end up, end up in your colon. So whether that's colon cancer because of polyps or, or Crohn's disease or diverticulitis or osis, whatever it is, you bet. You better believe that they had something going on at the top that nobody addressed, or they were on this proton pump inhibitor for the for a vast majority of their time. So that's why I get them off because I know that it's going to be it's a gateway drug. It leads to other things. Uh, you have a protect. Who takes Advil or Tylenol? Who's taking an Advil or a Tylenol? Yeah. Okay. So, mucin. Oh, sorry. Mucin. Okay. This is your protective layer in your stomach. So, guess what NSAIDs do? <laughs> kind of wreaks havoc on this, right? Because what do they do? What do they give us? Ulcers, right? So, this is why you get your ulcer. That's that barrier. So, alcohol, low vitamin C status, uh, not chewing your food, and another um, one which I just had a patient, parasites. So, 
Um, the NSAIDs are acidic molecules. They directly irritate the stomach. Here's an interesting fact. Um, it, it seems like a lot, but when you start breaking it down for some people, 3,000 in a lifetime increases kidney disease by 50%. It seems like an awful lot of Advil, Talon, or some kind of um, over-the-counter NSAID, but if somebody's taking four or five a day, and they're taking that for how long? 10, 15 years, it racks, you know, it starts to rack up in a hurry. Uh, it, they also, NSAIDs also decrease um, intestinal, they increase intestinal damage by allowing the bad bacteria to grow. So they actually change the environment. When you take one of that, it changes the environment inside of your, your gut. We'll talk more about that when we talk about the microbiome with the small intestine and the large intestine. Um, and then they damage the cells in there. And you don't want damaged cells because that leads to cancer, right? So as we get older, this goes down, so we need to find ways to actually keep this around. What do old people typically do, are given? A lot of NSAIDs. So, so probably one of the biggest questions I always ask, so after you eat a meal, do you feel bloated? Do you get nauseated? Um, do you have a white tongue? Any kind of food allergies, anything like that, undigested food in your stools, those are all signs of low um, stomach acid. So if you eat a meal and it just kind of sits there, you know, it takes about a half an hour for it to really clear, yeah, you're not, it's just, it's not doing its job. You're just, you're backing it up, it's not doing well. A lot of people will uh, have fragile fingernails as well too, because nutrient depletion, right? So if you're not breaking down your, your food, you can't absorb nutrients, you start to get fingernail issues. So what are the, some, of, some of the causes? Stress, stress kills, right? Too much protein, drinking too much during your meals, so that's why you shouldn't drink during your meals, right? Uh, lack of vitamin B1 and zinc. Zinc is a huge one. About 50 to 75% of people are deficient in zinc. I can pick out a guy from a mile away. It's pretty easy. He's deficient in zinc. Okay, so... Typically, as testosterone will decrease, you need zinc to make testosterone. So, this shows me that he's low on testosterone. She says he hasn't taken a blood test yet. So, yep. So yeah, that's that's where I start to look at that stuff. Uh, last, uh, lack of muscle mass is another pure, pure, uh, clear indicator because you can't build muscle without protein. And if even I'm like, oh gosh, I'm eating all this protein. Well, you're not absorbing it. So all those protein shakes you're drinking. In one head, out the other, right? Okay, so we kind of talked about reflux. So who has reflux? Or dealt with reflux? Cool. Okay. So that really that lack of stomach acid is where that starts. So that sphincter can't go slamming down over the stomach and stay shut because it's like, well, I don't really have to, right? I can just be lazy because I don't have enough acid in there to tell me to do that. Uh, they usually use a Heidelberg test, so it's a capsule, you swallow it to test your stomach acid, um, and then it comes up, then you gotta fish it out of the toilet on the other end. <laughs> so how we, we do a simpler test, so we actually give you stomach acid, okay? So if we give you acid on an empty stomach and you don't get any warming, that's a problem, because if I give you stomach acid, you should feel a nice warming sensation, right? Especially on an empty stomach, because I just, I induced um, the environment that where food would be in without any food. So you should be able to notice it. So we just, we do one, one capsule or one um, tablet on an empty stomach first day. If you don't get any um, warming, we try two. If you don't get any warming, we try three. If you don't get any three, you're pretty low, okay? Because you should be, if I give you hydrochloric acid, we should all be like, yeah. Drink, like you drank that hot chocolate or that coffee, hit that really warm spot, you're like, yeah, there you go, warmed you up. So there's where that comes as an issue. Uh, it's also, it also helps me know if you have an ulcer, whether it's in the stomach or in the uh, um, first part of the small intestine. Because if you get pain, I tell you to stop. So if you take one and all of a sudden it's lighting you up like, like 4th of July, you need to stop taking the pills and you tell people that because you have an ulcer and we have to deal with that. So a lot of people don't necessarily know they have an ulcer, they know they have the reflux, but the ulcer hasn't hit them. Uh, what are some of the foods that we need to really avoid if you have some reflux issues? Um, certain types of fats, so that's where we 
that's if you eat a fatty meal, a lot of times that's where the issue comes in. That's where you get the reflux. Chocolate, coffee. Coffee actually de brings our uh, acidic, uh, our pH more to that neutral, so that's where that becomes. So as people are eating their meal in the morning, their breakfast, and they're having coffee, so they're actually decreasing their ability to, to um, break down food. Mints. So if you have your coffee, you throw in a mint, so a spearmint or a peppermint. Sugar, of course, so you had your donut and your coffee, great. Uh, onions and alcohol. Alcohol just plays a role in all of this. So, uh, Who takes a fish oil? Who burps it up? Good, good. Because then if somebody takes a fish oil, like they just despise it because they burp it up, um, I know that they, they have low stomach acid because they can't break it down. Because that's one way. If they burp it up right away, it's stomach. If they burp it up a half an hour or to an hour later, that's farther down to your gallbladder, because that's the next step that we'll talk about as well, too. So yeah, it's a clear indication. It's not your, well, what could it be your fish oil? It could not be. What is, what is the, what they call burpless fish oil? Oh, the enteric coated? Yeah. So what? So they, they what just they coat the, the capsule a little bit, so that it, it stays in there. It doesn't break down as quickly. Oh. So that's okay. where, so they can be worked on more. But the other ones, yeah, if you have good digestion, you should be able to just yeah. eat away at the capsule and, excuse me, working on the uh, on the fish oil itself so you didn't get sick, okay? Uh, foods, foods that also irritate the esophageal lining, citrus fruits, most people know about that, tomato-based foods, spicy foods, carbonated beverages, and once again, coffee. Um, one of the other major causes that gets underlooked is hiatal hernia, so likes to push up underneath that left side rib cage because you got your liver here, stopping it over here. Press ups on the stomach, and you get this reflux action. So we check that. So, so once again, come to the chiropractor, get adjusted, get your hyaluronia hernia pulled down, and then let me show you. One of the easiest ways, just lay down on your back, relax your stomach, pull, pull down on your ribs on the left side, just underneath the rib there. Dig in underneath and pull down. As long as you, if you tighten up under there, then I know you have a hiatal hernia typically because you're like, oh, guarding. So. Uh, do you, do you want to know? Okay, so, so let's talk about the medications. So the, one of the more common, there's two different types, PPI and H2 um, inhibitors. So the, these stop the uh, specific cells from screening, your stomach from screening hydrochloric acid, uh, and these stop the, the hydrochloric acid being able to bind to the areas that it needs to, okay? Otherwise it just floats around, it can't do its job. So what are some of the problems? We talked about the B12, talked about the protein, but the other one is uh, iron. So if you can't digest a piece of meat to get your iron out of there, you're going to become what? iron deficient. So that's why a vast majority of, of the people that have the reflux issue are women. So, so the, they're, they seem to be the more majority of people on these medications. Uh, we talk about B12, uh, calcium, so actually leads to uh, fractures in younger adults now. The protein intake, so loss of muscle mass. Um, and also when you talk about uh, when they do your bone density scans and they, they're looking at the, like, oh, you need to eat minerals, calcium. In the healthy people of 2010, they were trying to limit um, osteoporosis. That was their big thing. So in the next 10 years, we're going to, it's become a worldwide epidemic. We're going to take osteoporosis and we're going to decrease it by 50%. So everybody take calcium. Okay? So now we've, we're at 2017 and we're finding too much calcium leads to um, hardening of the arteries and the walls, <laughs> or the walls of the arteries. Because that's where it gets deposited. It's not being used up. Uh, because when you think about calcium, that's the paint on the wall. And your bone needs stuff that's in the inside to be strong. So that's the matrix. So protein, uh, and that's called osteopenia. So when they talk about the scores, you have osteopenia before you have osteoporosis. So osteopenia needs uh, protein. or uh, The bones need the protein to make some collagen inside. That's the matrix. So vitamin C. Uh, magnesium and vitamin K, vitamin D, 
that would be the inside of the wall, the studs and all that stuff. That's what actually you want, the matrix of the bone to be strong. So they're telling you to, take, to paint the wall instead of that you could just push over, but we can make it stronger there. So protein, um, magnesium. So when somebody comes in <coughs> with a broken bone, I'm like, take this stuff. Don't worry about the calcium. You probably got enough of it. So uh, we talked about the increased infections. Anybody have an older adult in the hospital ever and they get C. diff? So, so C. diff a lot of times can lead to death because uh, it's very hard to control a lot of times. Uh, one of the last, it's mainly seen in the hospitals or in nursing homes a lot of times. So one of the, one of the things that they've used now is, um, anybody heard of a fecal transplant? So they actually insert feces from a healthy individual into the sick one. And it's actually been shown to be somewhat beneficial. Uh, but that's one of their last ditch efforts when they've tried antibiotic after antibiotic after antibiotic to kill this thing. So, so that's where that comes into it. Um, one of the other signs too is these people usually are, uh, are pretty sick all the time, just in general, because they can't fight infections. Doesn't it kind of seem like they always come up with, you know, hey, this is good for you, and then all of a sudden somebody else realizes mm -hmm. that yeah, this ain't so good for you anymore, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, what's really, yeah, cause what's, when we what's look, really good, you know? Yeah, yeah. when we look back in body. time, you start looking yeah. back in time on the stuff that we thought, so look, I always bring up bloodletting, because that's always kind of funny, that, okay, we got an infection, we'll just leak it out of you with bloodletting, okay? Well... As times change, you're like, well, people are dying, let's figure it out. Um, and a lot of times things are ha happen by chance where, you know, they might have bloodletted these people and left these people alone with this infection and they got better. You're like, huh, well, yeah, they, they gave them water. For these people, they didn't. And so these people, their infection was more of a dehydration issue and these people survived it because you cared for them and just let their body do what it does. Yeah, bodies are pretty magnificent. Aren't yes, so this, but we like to play. Russian roulette with it. So that's why that's a big, if somebody comes in on that, it's, it's very, it's my number one thing. That and sand drugs. That's number two. So, because those will lead to a lot of different things. Don't like, it makes me look bad because if you are adjusting somebody they don't get better, there's something else going on and if they don't want to address it or you don't address it, then, oh, chiropractic doesn't work. So, oh, well, you're inflamed, you get this, this, and this, and so we try to make sure we explain all that's why it's a whole body approach, not just getting somebody adjusted. So, because what happens in the north will show up in the south. So, all right. So, what can you do for reflux? Okay. Reflux help. Okay. So, at home, I usually start with the apple cider vinegar. It really does help for a lot of things. If if you have some mild cases or uh, occasional stuff. I start with that. If it doesn't work in 30 days, we go to the we go to the hydrochloric acid. So we use we use a product called Metagest or Acidzyme. It's got hydrochloric acid with um, pepsin in it, so you want both of it so that you can break down that protein and then uh, supply that body. You eat it during the meal, so because if you think about it, when you're eating the meal, that's when the stomach acid is starting to increase, right? So you take a few bites, swallow a pill. Take a few bites, swallow another pill, take a few bites, swallow another pill. So it's working on the food and helping you. Eventually your body is gonna get is gonna recognize it and then be able to produce on its own. So that's what's nice about your body, it can regenerate and actually produce acid on its own. So then once you start feeling warming, you pull it back, pull it back again until you don't need it anymore. Yay! And then every once in a while you might need something. That's where you can go on the apple cider vinegar. I'm like, then you can just use that as as needed or you go on apple cider vinegar or just for as long as you want. Can you do apple cider vinegar daily? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. There's no, no, at a four pH, you'd be totally fine. Yeah. Pretty tasty stuff too, isn't it? Uh, depends. <laughs> <how you make. laughs> so, I'm okay with taking four ounces of water and tossing her back with a tablespoon. Mm -hmm. So, there That's we go. That's all you need is just a tablespoon? That's what I start with, yeah. Huh. Yep. If you if you're if you're inducing too much acid, that then you then you really have a problem. So you don't want to go too overboard. So if you start feeling warming on on two, you should back it off to one. So because then yeah, you, like I said, then you then you went from not enough stomach acid to too much, and there's where our problem comes into. Can that hurt the enamel on your teeth when you? That's why you that? have. That's why. So people that shoot it, I tell them, well, if you like your teeth, I wouldn't do that because it is a four pH, and your teeth really don't like a sit around in a four pH. And I, 
So yeah, that's where you dilute it. Some people make teas, they do honey, they do... They're out just dumping some of the, it down I the just, throat. yeah, but not everybody's that way. They like to make their own concoctions. And so you can stuff. add it to something then? Yeah, yep, honey's okay. very good. If, raw honey, so make sure it's raw. And local would be best. There's just a lot of benefits to that. What's that? Just, to, just try to miss the teeth. Mm -hmm. if, you, yeah. if you can, but <laughs> just please. I didn't tell you that, okay? Uh -huh. So, all right, so you can supplement with that. Apple cider vinegar, uh, that's where we always start. Um, so to actually, so to pull somebody off of the, the reflux medication, we slowly get them off. We build up the, the lining and coat it around there first because as soon as you take them off, day one, they're like, yeah, I can do this. Day two, they hate you. Oh, it, it comes back with a vengeance. They'll get rebound reflux and they're, they're going to go right back on it. So you got to give them something to, 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 um, to calm that down. And we use uh, glutagenics. Glutamine works really well. Aloe vera. So this has glutamine, aloe vera, and um, what's called deglycerized licorice root, or DGL. Um, you can buy tablets of that too, and you can chew on that, and that works as a natural anti anti-acid without um, without decreasing the stomach, stopping the body's natural production of it. So that's something that we recommend, and that we have a capsule form of it, but. So if somebody, somebody's got to re, been on it for 25 years, I know I just can't pull it off. So start building this up, pull it off for a day. They might have to take a few scoops of this, take a few of this. This is my as needed. Like, can't carry this in your purse or in your pocket, whatever it is. You start getting some reflux, throw it down, okay? So because you, you need to calm that down, otherwise they'll never get off it. So the last lady was on it for 10 years. Like, and it's going to take you, however long you've been on the medication, it takes you about a month. So I go, okay, well, it's going to take us 10 months to get you off. Well, it's going to take us pretty well, it won't just take us two and a half years, but it's going to take us over a year to get you off it because you're going to be so reliant on it as soon as you pull someone off. It's a slow process. Um, so that's how we do that. It, it's very, very effective. Sometimes they got to gulp a bunch of this down if they're really, really bad. Or they have coffee and then have a spicy thing and they know they shouldn't. Like, mm, okay, well, better swallow a few of these too right behind it. Uh, ulcers. Anybody have an ulcer? No? No ulcers? Wow. Or at least that they know of. Okay. So ulcers. So we give you that acid challenge and you go, oh, that hurts. Okay. You have an ulcer. Stomach ulcer. Uh, we got to heal that, that lamp. So that mucin layer that you basically threw in the garbage with your NSAIDs or alcohol or coffee or whatever it was. Um, that's or your H. pylori infection, right? So that was diagnosed because they couldn't find it. We have to heal up that gut lining. Well, address, if it's H. pylori, kill the H. pylori and heal up the gut lining at the same time. If it's just an ulcer because you took too many um, medications or something like that or too much uh, PPIs and you stress too much, then we then we go after uh, we go after that. So the other place that you get an ulcer is the stomach empties in right about here, okay, um, into that small intestine. The first part is called your duodenum. So you can get some people, yeah, love when they try to come in and say, I got a duo something ulcer or inflammation. I'm like, oh, you got a duodenal ulcer. She's like, yeah, that's what it is. Okay, so your, your stomach will drip a little bit of acid into your small intestine to tell your gallbladder to squish and your pancreas to... Uh, squeeze out enzymes, so it, it, it's <coughs> part of the digestive process. So you do your digestive enzymes, you do your bile cells to break down your fats. Uh, if that acid doesn't, if that, if that, if there isn't enough acid and a little bit of it drips in and it doesn't get neutralized <coughs> by the pancreas because the pancreas secretes something like tons bicarbonate, then you're going to get that burning sensation inside that small intestine. Once again, anything outside the stomach that's too low acid is not going to be a good spot. It's going to burn it. Just like you get burning in the esophagus, you're going to get burning in the duodenum, the first part of that small intestine. So we got to calm that down too. Then you know that your pancreas isn't doing very good, your gallbladder probably isn't doing very good. So whatever happens in the north is going to show up in the south. See how it works as a system? So you, you start thinking about food, salivary glands start to go, you start to chew your food, hopefully 30 times to make it to do a liquid. Stomach starts to um, 
filled up that stomach acid, you swallow it, stomach acid is going to start to um, digest food, trips into that uh, first part of that small intestine, tells the gallbladder, okay, I'm going to squeeze out, so there's some bile salts because I got some fat in my meal, it's going to break down that fat, and then the pancreas then secretes lipase, amylase, and protease to break down further fats, carbohydrates, and proteins. So that my small intestine then can do what? Absorb all those nutrients so that I can survive and be thriving and not so sickly. All right. Uh, it usually also means you get poor motility. So you know like rumbling you get? That's what they call it um, the migrating motor complex. So it's mm -hmm. sweeping things down the pipe. So it, it's like, okay, you need to keep coming down, so nothing gets left behind. So that's, that's what that does. Um, and when you're hungry, it's like, yep, we're, we've moved everything on, let's, okay, time to get going here. Time to feed me so I can keep going. So if you don't have that, if, that, if you haven't eaten for a while and, and you don't get that, you have a poor uh, migrating motor complex, so you probably have a vagal nerve issue because that's what's telling it to do that. Once again, you got a brain issue. Uh, so, so the the H. pylori infection. Um, this is always funny. They do triple therapy, so two antibiotics uh, and an acid suppressing drug. So that's how we try to get rid of that H. pylori infection. Fifty percent of people have it. Um, why is it so dangerous? Stomach cancer. Okay. So that's why you want to address it. See, the more you let. People forget that infections cause cancer, and we seem to forget that as well too. And we're, when we treat cancer, we treat we treat the cancer. We don't treat the cause of the cancer. So, if you clear up somebody's cancer but never address the cause, isn't it likely to come back? That's because the cancer. That's that's the whole point, right? So, so five year survival rates are kind of a joke in my mind because you never really address that that um, cause. So that's another thing. Um, Little soapbox there. I have a question. What Please. Is, what about when you um, like, if you hear like liquid in your stomach, like, do you know like what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Is that just because you drink too much water, or? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you get slow emptying, right? So. Yeah. Is it, so that's just what it is. Yeah. I mean, it's gonna sit in your stomach for a while. I mean, if you're if you're drinking and then all of a sudden, you know, four hours later, you're sloshing around still. You got a, you got yourself a problem. You're not emptying at all. So, so that becomes um, something that you definitely want to address. Uh, with the H. pylori infection too, after they've treated it, it usually comes back in about 12 months. Studies show. So, if you've been treated for an H. pylori infection, come talk to me. Gone. Okay, so with the ulcers, we use zinc, which 50% of people are deficient in. So, do you think 50% of people have an issue with their, their lining in their stomach and their small intestine? Yep. So, uh, colostrum. What was the very first thing you should have gotten in life? <laughs> colostrum. Breast right? Mom. Right? Breastfed. So, when babies don't get breastfed, they. There's not, there isn't colostrum in um, formula, right? Because they haven't been able to, they haven't, they haven't been able to mass produce it that way. So colostrum, there are companies that actually will make, get bovine colostrum um, and get it so that it's into a powder form. So we use that. But yeah, so just think of it. That first thing that hits your, you know, hits your digestive tract, your stomach, is now providing the stomach layer and the intestinal layer uh, protection. So then as you start to drink mom's milk, yay, we're not, we're not leaving ourselves to damage to whatever mom was eating and then how we can digest our food. So colostrum is one other way. Uh, chlorophyll is another one. Um, the glutagenics we use. Um, and there's a herb called gutacola that works really well. Um, it heals tissues through collagen formation. So that helps stimulate that. Uh, it also helps with, so that cola is pretty cool because it helps, uh, anybody got Raynaud's? You may have heard that where the, their mm -hmm. fingers turn white. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this helps with that, that mic, the capillary circulation at the very end. So those people that have warm wrists and cold fingertips, those people usually have a, a microcirculation issue. 
health, thyroid issue, a couple other things. Um, vitamin C works really well because collagen. So those are those vitamin C people. So once again, collagen plays a huge role in everything. So if we use zinc, there's a special form of zinc called zinc carnosine, uh, not just here. So you just don't go buy any zinc off the counter because um, certain forms are specific for that, that lining. Uh, there's a dermatotrophin PMG is another product that we have uh, that helps uh, heal the cells. So it's also good for that leaky gut. So that, we'll talk about leaky gut next time. Okay, so with that issue, we end up with inflammation, right? So how does inflammation play a role? Good. So when we get inflammation, this is the root of all evil, right? So if you've got an inflamed gut and stomach, there's no way you can digest. It starts to create that leaky gut issue, so it starts to break the bonds in between the cells, and so that's what you get the leakiness for, I've heard that term. So as you try to, as you try to eat and absorb food, if it doesn't get break down, especially that protein, you absorb it into the bloodstream, it's going to look like something in your system. Foreign, a virus, thyroid, um, what other things? Joints, so there's your RA, right? So lupus, all those types of things. If it's a nerve, it's MS. So if we don't address inflammation, you're just going to continue to not be able to absorb and heal up. So everybody heard of turmeric, right? Curcumin. Super good. Everybody should be taking some every day to help regulate some of that, uh, to regulate that inflammation. Boswellia, anybody use frankincense? Great for, yep. So I always try to get the people that use the oils, kind of drink them, right? I mean, really, if you just put them on top, you know, yep, you're, you're smelling, getting some absorption, but really, if you want to make, if you want to make a change, you've got to be taking it internally so that it can work systemically, right? So Boswellia, is from the makes frankincense ginger. Uh, we use a product called Herbalese. It's got all three of them in there. Fish oil. Everybody should be on fish oil. I don't care who you are. Um, somebody just came in and said, "Well, they just said fish oil isn't good for you." Go on to PubMed and type in fish oil and the benefits, and you will see more information on that. It's been studied more than anything else. Uh, you can get it as a prescription. So they obviously think that something's good about it if you can get it as a prescription, right? I don't know where they get their fish, so there's issues like that. Um, so that, that plays a big role. <clears throat> and then you need to heal, heal up that stomach lining um, and get that inflammation down, otherwise we're going to be in a world of hurt. So it seems really simple to me. It gets kind of complex with people, but um, if you give them the plan, they work really well with it and know that they can get off this stuff. All right, so let's move on down. So. Liver and gallbladder. Okay, liver is probably my favorite organ because it does so much. Okay, it's your detoxification. Uh, it, it converts your thyroid hormone. What else? Uh, glucose. It spikes your glucose. So if you get fatty liver, those are your diabetics, things like that. So it's, it plays a huge role. Um, if you're waking up between the hours of 1 and 3 at night, if you go to bed at a decent time, that's when your liver's regenerating. It usually means you got something going on there. It's not regenerating. So that's an issue. Uh, there's more than 2,000 enzymes present in there. So enzymes are super important. You start getting deficient in enzymes. That's not so good. Uh, you can lose 70% of your liver function without um, having anything show up. So people are like, whoa, why am I so sick? Uh, when somebody turns jaundice, yeah, they're over 70%. It's been there for a while. Uh, its major job in digestion is bile production. So it's what makes the bile, right? It basically makes one liter, and then it gets distilled down into the gallbladder to about 1.7 ounces. That's a whole lot of fluid down to one little thing. And that's where it gets stored is in that gallbladder. Uh, it's... The bile then is treated for fat, di fat digestion. So if you, it also, 
um, bile also helps regulate cholesterol. So those people's cholesterol starts to go up, they got a bad gallbladder. So that's why most of the stones, 90% of the stones are what? Cholesterol. So when the gallbladder doesn't squeeze because it didn't get the signal from the stomach to squeeze, that cholesterol sits in there and they get a stone. And then eventually, um, by happen chance, they might have got a scan and they see a bag full of stones in there, and like, well, that's gotta come out. I'm not having any symptoms. Don't take it out, okay? Really, if you, if you got a stone stuck in the duct, yes, it's probably a time you need surgery and take the thing out because it's probably not gonna get through, all right? Um, if it's sitting there, you can get rid of stones. We have a couple different ways for you to do it. It just takes about 24 hours, and you can get rid of a lot of stones, and you'll see them in the toilet, and you'll be all happy that they're all gone. Um, so, so if you don't have enough bile production because you got a crappy liver, because 70% of it's not working, uh, it's the major way to get rid of it, because you got to poop all your cholesterol, all your excess cholesterol. So it goes in through, uh, it gets broken down through the by the bile, so that it can be excreted. Same way as bile is also good for estrogen. So if somebody's got a bad gallbladder, doesn't have a gallbladder, I know they got an estrogen issue as well too. Not able to get rid of estrogen because you poop out estrogen as well too, which can lead to estrogen cancers, prostate cancer, um, breast cancer, that type of stuff. So that's why the gallbladder isn't just take it out. We need it. We like it. Um, another sign: constipation. So can't get rid of cholesterol. Don't have enough bile, can't break stuff down, fat, it's gonna sit in there and you're gonna feel bloated, constipated, all right? And the last one, insulin resistance, is another big one. That shows up. Oh, that's right, fight, uh, infections in the gut, too. So those people that have um, gut infections all the time, or just feel sick, that's another one. So bile is super important. And because you need your gallbladder, uh, if you only have the liter and you don't have the 1.7 ounces, you're not distilling it down to its stronger point, right? So now you, you have this weak bile that's trying to work on your system and it can't do the job because you didn't take enough of it and, and work it down so that now it can do its job. So, so if you don't have that, we gotta actually, if anybody who doesn't have a gallbladder, we have to give them bile because they don't have enough of it. So you can use ox bile, it's the most common form. Is it still believe me? See, because you 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 need to eat fat, so you can't avoid fat, right? Because fat's good for your brain, helps you lose weight. Um, backbone of your um, backbone of your uh, cell layer cell um, membranes. So if your cells are crappy, you start looking older, start getting grayer, wrinkles, things like that. So, so you need fat. So if somebody has a gallbladder and they can't digest fat, they're going to age quicker than somebody else. Okay. Uh, the vagus nerve also plays a role in that squeezing. And, yeah. So if you get reflux about an hour, half hour to an hour after your meal, that's this. It's not stomach. You got a lack of bile. So the bile is not doing its job. So it's actually working its way back up into the stomach and in through that. So it'll go backwards up, up through there. So that's, that's another good indication when I ask, okay, when do you get your reflux? I'll get it right away. Stomach, oh, I get it later. Or I burp, and all of a sudden you eat a meal and it's two hours later and you go, huh? and you start getting hiccups or burps. Yeah, we got an issue here. Minnesota is known that but 50% of the patients that come in the door don't have a gallbladder. So um, they don't absorb fats, we are in PPIs, we eat foods that don't agree with us, we have glyphosate and pesticides, things like that. So, all right, so symptoms, gas, bloating, loose stools. One of the clear indications you don't have a good, um, a good gallbladder is if you, if you got a floating stool because fat floats. So you look in there like, oh, it's like a bobber. Nope, oh, it should be at the bottom of the toilet. It should not be floating in the top like it's swimming. So that's a clear indication that you got something going on with bile and fat absorption. Uh, somebody comes in, they got pain in between the shoulder blades, especially the right side, gallbladder. A lot of times, start looking at that because it radiates to the right shoulder. Sometimes it'll radiate across, but it does love like the shoulder blade area. You adjust somebody, if somebody, hey, I got a rib out, 
adjust them. Should be going back in. It's not. I'm like, okay, stick my fingers underneath their rib cage. Oh, there we go. Yeah, you got an inflamed gallbladder on that right side. They're really happy about that, at least knowing that, because then, okay, we can deal with that. Let's do this, do that. Catch it before it becomes an issue. Uh, itchy skin is another one. And peeling skin on the soles of the feet. So if you have that person, especially during the summer, when you look at them like, oh my gosh, you got scaly looking feet. Bad gallbladder. Okay. Uh, swelling in the hands and feet. Um, of course, the jaundice, yellowing of the eyes, around the corners of the mouth. That's all that stuff. Okay. Anybody heard of non alcoholic fatty liver disease? So, uh, you used to only see fatty livers in alcoholics, and now you, I see it in 30 year olds because their livers are bad. Uh, fat deposits stay in there and they can't get rid of it because of the bile and everything like that, and so that starts to decrease the liver action. Um, it can make you really, really sick eventually. Uh, the cool thing about the liver is you can cut pieces of it out and it will regenerate. It's the only organ that will do that, so cool. But I really just like to keep it healthy as much as we can, so be kind to your liver. Um, too much triglycerides in the blood, so those are the people that don't are usually eating high refined sugars, too many carbs, high fructose corn syrups, things like that, processed foods, basically the sad American, well, standard American diet called SAD. Um, you also get what's called non-alcoholic uh, steatohepatitis, so that's when the accumulation of fat in the liver leads to that inflammation. That's why when somebody comes in, I run liver enzymes on them. It's just standard, no matter what, if they're going to come sit down and talk with me because I need to know what their detoxification system is doing, what their hormone detoxification is, all that stuff. Otherwise, they, because it, when I see swelling in the hands and feet, I think liver, I don't think heart. When you go to the doctor, they're thinking heart because you can die that right away. I'm thinking liver, you'll die eventually from it, but if we clear that up, you feel a lot better. So brain fog, things like that. Those are always big issues. Uh, one of the big things, anybody heard choline? So the interesting thing, they took this out of people's diets to test it, and they all got liver damage, liver disease. So they're like, whoa, okay, let's add it back into these people. And the liver's cleared up. So it used to be thought of as non-essential, um, mineral and vitamin. They're like, well, you kind of need it now. Uh, eggs, really good for it. Uh, what this makes in your gallbladder is what's called phosphatidylcholine, so it makes the slipperiness so that it can squeeze so those stones don't stay in there or those, or the bile doesn't stay there. So otherwise it gets sludge-like and that's the non-functioning gallbladder. Well, you probably don't have enough choline because you're probably not. You're probably eating refined. You're eating cereal in the morning, probably, um, or not eating anything in the morning, and you're not getting enough choline in your diet to make that stuff slippery. Uh, it's also good for your brain. Choline is very important for your brain. So, brain always is a big thing, right? So, okay. So, just gallbladder issues when you have a dysfunctional gallbladder. We really believe that you don't need it. Well, you know, we'll just take it out, your body will adapt, and we'll be able to do those things. Um, it's, it's never the gallbladder's fault. It's something that's happened. So stomach acid that wasn't being secreted, the liver wasn't doing its job, so it wasn't secreted enough. You didn't get enough choline in your diet. So there's always a reason for the dysfunction. It's just not that it just all of a sudden occurred. So we, we need to start asking, when you go to the doctor, ask them, okay, why is this happening? A lot of times, I don't know why it's happening, right? So let's just look at the physiology of it all and how it all works and as a system. Um, I put this into my notes as a side note. So besides the gallbladder, what's the other thing that usually gets taken out without really thought? Pancreas. Yep, okay. It's the nursery for your good bacteria. So you take it out, now you just decreased what your body was trying to do. So it's, it's making those good bugs that your body is supposed to be doing and that for the rest of the system. So the large intestine and part of the small intestine. So you take that out, now you just took your nursery out and hopefully you have enough in there to help you the rest of the time. So if somebody's earlier in life getting it taken out, they obviously have a much greater issue of later on having issues down the road, digestive issues because... Perfect, I just have... figured out my issue then. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Right, you're right. taken out when I was 12. Yeah. Yep, it's pretty common at that age. Perfect, I'm out of here. There you yeah. go. <laughs> uh, 
so that bile gets sludge like. We talked about that. You don't want a sludge like bile because it stays in that gallbladder and we have a big issue there where you can't squish it out. Uh, stones develop, majority of them with cholesterol. Um, Go figure bile needs cholesterol as its backbone and you're, you're not able to get rid of cholesterol through the stool because of that issue. So, uh, What to do for a healthy liver and gallbladder? Uh, how many people eat fiber in their diet? Good. About 5 grams is the average American diet. You need about 40. Okay. So there's an issue, right? It's not making things, pushing things along, feeding the good bugs. So that's a big issue. Vitamin C will help with the gallstones as well. Uh, phosphatidylcholine, that's that choline that we need. Turmeric, because if you've got a bad gallbladder and it's inflamed, you need to calm it down. So turmeric is really good. Uh, milk thistle, really good for the liver. A lot of people know that. Artichoke, beet juice. Anybody drink beet juice? I love beets. Yeah. Beet juice helps the liver form bile. There you go. It's really good. Uh, we talked about the fatty liver, choline does. Uh, to get choline, we talked about eggs, what other places? Beef, so eat your beef. Grass fed, okay, conventional, we want to put off to the side if we can, but grass fed cow, uh, free range chicken. Uh, liver is coming back now because of all the good um, benefits you get from liver. So you actually buy liver online now and get it shipped. So if you eat liver, great, liver and onions. Um, salmon, chickpeas, we talked about the wonderful eggs. Yeah, chickpeas are good for them. They're helps the, good for the uh, liver and gallbladder, for choline. All right, N-acetylcysteine. So when people come in, I run a GGT on them. Okay, so your, so your oxidative stress issue that I was asked about earlier, you have a master antioxidant called glutathione. Uh, it's made in your liver. You can't, you, they haven't found a decent way to supplement until somebody shows me enough studies that you can supplement with it on its own, then yeah, I'll, I'll be on board with that. But right now, studies show that you can try and supplement it, but it really doesn't raise the levels. So you need to take stuff that'll make um, glutathione. This, if this is floating around in you, if this level is too high, um, out of the range, then that means you're not recycling this back into the liver. And so you have a liver issue where you're not able to make um, this back into glutathione. So it means you have an oxidative stress issue a lot of times. And a liver, which of course that means a liver issue as well too. So we use N-acetylcysteine. That, that's, the, that's the step that makes, um, that's what's needed, the substrate to make glutathione. So we use that. Uh, works really well. Alpha lipoic acid, also really good. Uh, anybody heard of MTHFR gene mutations? So methylation, about 40% of the people in the room have it. So you can't take your folic acid that is in every food now, and you can't turn it into um, its active form. When you can't do that, you can't methylate. So we run what's called a homocysteine on people, and if that's too high, that's it's a marker for heart disease more, but it's, it's really a methylation issue. So if that's too high or too low, you're... If it's too low, you have a dietary issue, you're not eating enough of certain things. Sulfur-rich foods, which are cruciferous vegetables, so people are using there, hunkering down a lot of them. Um, but if it's too high, then I know you, you, the likelihood of you having this methylation issue is pretty high. So we need to bring that down, otherwise it will eventually lead to some kind of heart disease, um, hardening of the arteries, because it's your vessel health is a big one. Uh, avoid sugar, right? So. <laughs> Should be a no-brainer, right? Because fatty liver disease is going to lead to sugar, or sugar leads to fatty liver disease. So, all right, pancreas on the home stretch. All right, pancreas. So that secretes digestive enzymes uh, and some alkaline fluid. That's what stops that burning sensation of that of that uh, um, small intestine, that first part just below the stomach. It's got over a dozen hormones related to digestion. The cool, well. The cool thing and uncool thing, it's like a bank account. So once you run out of enzymes, you can't make any more. So you have a limited supply of enzymes throughout your lifetime. So it'd be a good idea to take a digestive enzyme every once in a while just to give it a little bit of a break so it doesn't have to work so hard. But if you're, if you're really trying to make it grind to, because you don't have enough stomach acid, that's a problem. So now you're going to use up more enzymes because it has to work on that food longer um, and harder, so you're going to have to screen more. So that's a big issue. 
uh, gluten stops the pancreas from secreting enzymes. So, so it can protect. It's got a, it's got something inside of it that tells the pancreas um, as a protective mes, me, mechanism to say, hey, don't eat me. I need to stay in here so I can wreak havoc on the rest of the body and create a leaky gut and create inflammation, hypothyroidism, things like that, Hashimoto's. So, uh, otherwise, it would that enzyme would permanently break that down. That's where we would get issues. Where some people get issues. So it's just, they can't break it down. Nobody can break it down. So some people just heal. So people that are don't react to gluten just heal quicker than others who do. So everybody's got gluten sensitivity. It's just a matter of how much they have, how much it's affecting them. Because um, that gluten will lead to that leaky gut and, and eventually autoimmune conditions. Okay, pancreas problems, indigestion, um, flatulence beginning an hour or more after the meals, floating stool again. So that's part of the pancreas. Greasy, smelly, uh, dry. Uh, greasy and smelly stools, dry, flaky skin, um, small hard bumps on the back of the arms a lot of times because they can't break down. I usually go after gluten for people or dairy if it's kids a lot of times uh, because if you can't break down, they have a pancreas issue, right? So there's a big issue, there's that issue. And night blindness is associated with pancreas problems. Uh, you get those duodenal ulcers we talked about because the pancreas can't do, can't secrete the bicarbonate. One of the big scary ones, pancreatitis, right? You don't want to mess with the pancreas, right? If you hear somebody gets uh, pancreatic cancer, it's not a good day. I mean, they're, it's months, right? You know, sometimes days. Somebody gets diagnosis and they're gone in a couple days. Uh, so you, you, you want to be nice to your pancreas because we don't know how to do anything with it other than um, pray sometimes. So when you get that pancreatitis, you get inflammation, and if it becomes chronic, that's where you get pancreatic cancer. So when you start getting, so one time, all right, let's deal with it, two times, okay, this is getting a little scary, three times, you start to get, you, by the third time, you're you're well on your way to um, to cancer. So that's, those are, so if you have people that have chronic pancreatitis, you want to deal with that, because that's going to lead to cancer. Just like uh, chronic um, diverticulitis is going to lead, diverticulosis is going to lead to colon cancer. So. All right, so you need that pancreas, right, for the lipase, protease, and amylase uh, to really start to break down that food. So what happens in that north will show up in the south. If you don't address just the basic stuff, so chew your food, right? So we want to chew our food, maybe take some apple cider vinegar. If that's not working, we do supplement with some acid. We do some replacement in there, so part of that 5-hour program and that program guide, the replacement, that's digestive enzymes and acid. Sometimes we have to do some bile salts, support the gallbladder and liver. So that this it's, works as a system, right? It's just not, oh, you take this medi one medication. That's simple, but it leads to other big problems. Uh, you need your gallbladder. If you don't have one, you'll need support for it for its absence. Because if it's gone, God had it in there for a reason. Now we need to do something to help replace it. Uh, the liver and gallbladder work as a team, so if you have a liver issue, you're going to have that gallbladder issue and vice versa. The pancreas is like that bank account, helps support it so you don't run out of the enzymes. So, any questions? We covered a lot. Yeah, there's a lot of information. So this was just part one. Part two, we're going to go over small intestine, large intestine, uh, and then the microbiome. So we'll discuss things like IBS, well both of them IBSD, IBSC, SIBO, anybody heard of that? Small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So that's when you get a, an, um, an overgrowth of good or bad bacteria, it can be both, that went from the small or the large intestine and crawled up into the small intestine and creates a lot of gas and bloating discomfort. Um, that's the easy ones that it causes. The other ones are headaches, anxiety, depression, a bunch of other different things that you can get. Uh, and we'll discuss leaky gut and different ways that you can test for it. So, any questions on gut? No questions? Wow.